and we decided it maybe was a really good year for us to learn a bit more about ourselves, about other library foundations around the country, um, about investment strategies, about staffing, and about grant programs at all sorts of other libraries and foundations around the country. And so 2017 was a year where the staff and the board really rolled up their sleeves and tried to learn more about what other people were doing and how we could be better at what we do. So one of the things we decided to undertake was to actually learn more about you, our donors. So we, um, we did a donor survey. Does anybody remember getting a survey last year that they filled out for us? We actually had kind of a remarkable 26% response rate to our survey. You know, usually if you work with like a survey company, like one and a half percent is great, right? We had 26%, which means you all are good readers. You read your email or your mail and you're great at responding, which means it's a great sample. 26% of our people actually gave us feedback. Um, so what they told us, we wanted to learn more about like, Many of you give unrestricted gifts. Where do you want to see those gifts go in the library? What do you care about um, in terms of where the foundation kind of directs those funds? Um, and actually 60% of you said, you're very happy with giving the gifts where it's needed most. Like that's the most broad answer we could provide, but you kind of trust the library and the foundation to say, hey, we need it for collections, hey, we need it for a program, hey, we need it for computers. And 60% of you felt really confident with that. About 40% of you said you really like to see it go towards collections, which I think is a very telling um, aspect of what we do. Many of you are library users. You love using your library cards, whether it's for DVDs or books or playaways or anything else. Um, and so I think many of you also recognize that we really haven't seen additional support in the collections area since 2008. So we took a big cut in 2008 in terms of our budget, and we've never restored that cut. So I think we also know that that budget is being stretched to the very thinnest point possible, and that supporting collections and the wide range of collections that we have is something that you all really care about. We also wanted to know a little bit more about like how you like to hear from us. About 75% of you said you love getting our emails. And, and actually, I just was running into some people this weekend who were like, I read your email, I know you have, I think Eve actually said that to me, is Eve here? You're like, I know you have new staff members, that was in your email. So I love the fact that many of you read those and learn more about what's going on at the library and the foundation. And one more interesting thing, we asked how many of you would like to be in focus groups. 27% of our respondents indicated that they would be in a focus group. Which is again, remarkable. Like a number of people actually came out probably had about 30 people. I know Shannon Kleiber, who's on chair of our marketing committee, actually led some of those focus groups. And we asked much more detailed questions of our focus groups to learn more about what they thought about planned giving, what they thought about our grants, what they thought about library services, what they thought about the foundation's work. So we really were so pleased to learn more and adjust what we do and how we communicate with you um, as part of our process. So that was part of our year of learning, was to learn more about our donors and how we can get you the best information and, and share our stories with you the best that we can. We also did a lot of research. So we, we researched 12 library foundations around the country. Our board members actually rolled up their sleeves and called and spoke to staff or foundation staff members at each library foundation around the country and asked them a series of about 12 to 15 questions. Um, and we learned about their staff size, their board size, how much money they raise, what events they do, how they recognize donors, what they do with their strategic plan, what kind of volunteer programs they run. But it really helped us look at what other people are doing, where they're succeeding and challenged. I think some of our board members came back and said like, somebody does a gala that raises like $600,000 or, you know, and some of it's like, wow, that sounds great, but I don't think that's gonna happen for us. Um, but. You know, I think it's super educational, though, to learn what other library foundations are doing and what they're succeeding at and where they're challenged or not challenged. And so I think it helped us kind of assess, like, great, we're doing a number of events, but people like us are also saying, like, we don't need more events, we need less events, you know, we, we, in terms of fundraising events. Or I think it assess our, help us assess our staff size and kind of for the money we raise, is our staff size right? Is our board size right? 
Um, so I think it was really an educational opportunity. We also learned a lot about investments. And as many of you know, we have endowments here that are managed by the Madison Community Foundation. But we asked a lot of questions about how different foundations manage uh, the investment funds that donors give them that support the long-term um, health of the library system in general. Um, so one of the other things that kind of came out of, out of our strategic planning discussion was really thinking about how we could support foundation staff and foundation board members um, to participate in organization events and um, trainings around town to really help us kind of uh, uh, gather a more diverse group of volunteers um, to the library board, the staff, and among our broad volunteer base too. So we decided to invest funds in making sure that we could participate in trainings and other events around town to help us do that. So now I'm gonna to turn to talk about our grant program. So many of you give to our annual fund, which is where all the unrestricted money that we raise go. And what we do with that is our grant. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about that. In 2010 is when I arrived here. I was the full, first full-time executive director for the Library Foundation. We gave out $30,000 in grants that year. In 2017, we gave about $269,000 in grants. So I think that says a lot for both the growth of the organization, but also I think it, it says a lot for the opportunities that are presented at the library um, that I think inspire people to want to be donors. Um, one of the big things we funded was actually a $100,000 gift um, that will hire a project manager in early childhood. So we actually have youth services librarians, but they're primarily focused on school age kids. And so we decided to invest in, a, in an early childhood project manager for the next two years to help us uh, do some particular outreach around town. So the list up here that you see is kind of some of the outreach. So the, the Northside Early Childhood Zone is one of the efforts that that person will participate in. There's a new exhibit coming to town called The Wonders of Learning. We're developing a new concept in the New Penny Library called the Play Lab. And there's also the Imagination Library, which is Dolly Parton's effort that's being worked on with United Way, getting books into people's homes. So our early childhood coordinator, that's just some of the things that person will work on. But I think it's great that we're investing in the effort to support early childhood reading um, as part of what we're doing at all nine of our libraries. Um, a couple other things that we invested grant funds in are equity collection. So what that basically is was grant funds that um, helped us support popular titles. A lot of the too good to miss titles are popular titles in libraries um, where they may be checked out because of holds. So libraries like Meadow Ridge or Goodman South Madison, people come in and they want to get those books, but we have many fewer holds at those libraries. So people kind of expect for things to be on the shelf when they arrive at the library. So one of the things we invested in was having more books that can't be put on hold on the shelves at those libraries for patrons who come into those libraries. So that was one of our investments too. We, every year, we invest in professional development for librarians. We want them to be the very best librarians that they can be. And so every year we support uh, folks going to conferences locally, nationally, and internationally. Um, we also support staff day. So once a year in September, the libraries are closed and we bring everybody here and we do a day long event of workshops and speakers and staff exchanges um, as a great professional development opportunity. So every year we feel it's important to invest in that. Um, and then finally, we invested in the Penny Mini Film Festival. So Penny Library um, invests a lot in the Wisconsin Film Festival and does a lot of feature films at that library. And so it's kind of one of the key features that they focus on and do really well with their, with their audience and, and have a lot of checkouts from that library too. So we supported the, the film festival that was in that library within the last year too. So we do have endowments, um, and that is one of the key investment areas that we have. Every year, we put 10% of what we raise in the annual fund into the endowment. So we take part of that annual fund each year and grow the endowment. The other way we grow the endowment is through bequests um, or other planned gifts. Those are the two primary ways that we do that. So the distribution, so each year we get a percent return. It's about 4.5% from MCF. And last year we had about $182,000 that we invested back in the library from our distributions. 
We have 13 endowment funds, that's one for each library. And then we have special collection endowments too. So we have an endowment for the book club kits. We have an endowment for large print books. So there's specialty collections that have been started uh, through bequests. So I just want to give you a couple examples though of what those endowment funds support. And I think it really crystallizes why it matters. So the Lakeview Library used their endowment to buy, um, to purchase adaptive toys or switches for adaptive toys. So here's an example, and I'll have to actually read this because it's a specific example. So one example is an Elmo doll that talks and sings if a child squeezes its belly. Some children are not able to squeeze the doll. So this is where the switch is useful. Depending on the needs of the child, parents can choose from a large or small button to press or one that works just by proximity. When the switch is plugged in the toy, the child can successfully activate the doll to sing or to talk. Um, the toys just arrived at Lakeview uh, towards uh, the last quarter of the year, and they're now using them, and they're marketing them specifically to some of the North Side agencies, like the North Side Early Childhood Zone, to make sure that families learn that they have these things that you can check out and use with toys that you might have in your home. So um, it's just one example of what the endowment could do that maybe kind of um, advances the community in a way we hadn't thought of. Um, Sequoia used their endowment to buy more seating. A lot of people go to Sequoia. We need a lot of seats for studying and reading. So they uh, added more seating to their collection. And Penny Library replaced a sofa in their children's area. They've gotten too worn down. So well-loved things that just sometimes need replacement, and the endowment comes in really handy for those things. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about all the, of our donors and how you are supporting the libraries, because it's the gifts you give that allow all these things that we're talking about to happen. So we had 820 new donors join us last year, which is great. Um, we had 3,012 actual donors contribute to the Madison Public Library Foundation, and we have 272 loyal friends. And loyal friends are people who give for 10 years or more consecutively. So they've given to us for a longer time. Um, so we thank each and every one of those, and I just want to give you a big round of applause. So each one of you are loyal friends, or donors, or any other who make all of this happen. Um, many people give to multiple things, so we had over 4,000 gifts in total. People may have given to events and, and other things. And we also really have been working on our sustainer program. So sustainers are people who give monthly, who either use a credit card or a bank account and give monthly. We had 40 sustainers. We're hoping to double that in the coming year. Um, those donors actually, kind of the, the research on those donors is they usually give a little bit more because they spread it out over time. Um, but they also stay with you longer. So we have more people who become loyal friends just because there's less likely to be a gap in, in their giving history. One of the things that was particularly remarkable in 2017 is how much restricted donations we raised. So because we weren't working on the Penny Campaign, we decided to work with the library and identify some key programmatic areas that needed special support. We raised over $1,052,000 last year in restricted support. So some of these are some really substantial gifts. Um, a foundation called Schmidt, Schmidt Futures gave money for the bubbler to be in MMSD schools. So we did a program last year, and our bubbler, which is our maker program, set up um, making spaces in six schools last year. We're going to do two more cohorts of that same thing in the coming year, working with MMSD schools and helping to set up making programs at those schools as well. So that was one of the substantial gifts last year. Another substantial gift was from the Goodman Foundation, which is funding a new project which will begin at the, at, at the beginning of 2019, but they gave the, the gift in 2017. So we are gonna be uh, purchasing and availing a new Reed Mobile. Um, for those of you who have seen the Dane County Bookmobile around town, that Bookmobile can only go to communities where there's no light. So it can't come to Madison communities. Like that's kind of the, the statute around it. Um, so what we're doing is actually working with the county to purchase a vehicle that will go to five communities here in Madison. Here's the five communities. One day a week, each week. Um, so every week it'll go to 
uh, Leopold School. Every week it'll go to an ally drive. And so this new Readmobile, it costs about a half million dollars to purchase it and staff it for the next four years. And we got a very substantial gift from the Goodman Foundation to get that going. Um, but we've also had a lot of gifts this year that'll help support the staffing, insurance, all the other things that it takes to actually run that vehicle. So we're extremely excited about it. We identified these locations um, mostly because they're low income or they have a really hard time getting to a library. Like Owl Creek over here, which was our pilot site, they're over kind of by the Dane County Humane Society. It's pretty hard to get to a library from that location. You have to go over the highway, you know, and public transportation may be difficult. So we really looked at sites where it was more challenging to get to a library. We want to bring the books, the DVDs, the computer. This vehicle will have Wi-Fi associated with it and librarians will be staffing it. So that was a, a big part of last year's work. We also got another grant to actually do some refurbishment of our Goodman South Madison Library, it's particularly our teen area. It's one of the great examples of teens heavily using that library. Is anybody here at Goodman South Madison uh, user? Okay, one. Um, so it, it is heavily used by teens and the space is really too small for what our teens need. So we actually work directly with the teens to talk about what they wanted in the space if we were to redesign it. So that was one of the major restrictive gifts that we got last year, have been working on, and actually in August the library will be closed for a week to actually do that renovation. So we're very excited about that. Um, we did a lot of support of the Bubbler program. We supported artist residencies both here at Central as well as at all nine libraries. Um, we supported Making Justice, which is a program in which we use artists to work with kids who are in, um, the, in the justice system and, and try and work with them on some different programming. Um, so we did a lot of bubbler funding within the last year as well. And then the Meadow, library, Meadow Ridge Library Kitchen is also something we provided funding for. When it, we provide sack lunches at the Meadow Ridge Library, we have a lot of kids who come after school and stay till the library closes. And so we have sack lunch program for that. We have a teen dinner club that does uh, a teen dinner once a week. And we have community suppers. So uh, we found donors who were happy to support some of those programs at, at the Meadow Ridge Library too. So that's just a sample of some of the uh, restricted dollars we brought in that help support many of our libraries and many of the different activities um, and outreach work that our libraries are undertaking. So I mentioned the book festival a little bit. Um, last year at the book festival, we had over 16,000 people attend the Wisconsin Book Festival. Um, and then we had about 8,600 people attend the actual four day event. So the book festival runs all year long. Events like this happen all year long with authors. And so our participation in the book festival continues to increase and we continue to be able to bring in really fantastic authors I think are inspiring to all of us. Um, this is Jason Reynolds. He actually did High School Friday, which is the Friday of the book festival. Um, he actually wrote some of the, Marvel has a young adult series and he wrote the Spider-Man novels as part of that. And so he did a great job at talking to the kids about the writing he does, his own experience. And many of these kids go to Capitol High School, which is an alternative high school on the east and west side. Um, so they're just some of the kids who actually uh, participate in High School Friday. Lots of different authors and many volunteers. We have almost 200 volunteers who support things like the Wisconsin Book Festival and help us at those events. So I finally want to mention uh, the Silas Penny Legacy Society. Some of you in this room could raise your hands if you are a member of the Silas Penny Legacy Society. Thank you. Um, these are donors who have determined that the library should be in their, in their estate plan. So people who are including us in their bequest or their will or in their retirement plan. So uh, we have 41 donors who are identified in that way. Um, and we're thankful to each and every one of you who have uh, uh, been thinking about that as well. Um, we did a couple programs around uh, our Silas Penny Society, inviting people to learn more. And we did one in 2017 and we're doing two in 2018 and got some feedback about what people wanted to learn about. So that's been a big part of what we're doing. Um, we did do our normal three events last year. We raised $114,000 at those events. Lunch for Libraries, which we usually do in the spring, raises all of its money for the book festival. So it usually raises over $40,000 for the book festival. Um, Rock and Read supports our summer reading program. 
So all of those funds actually go to make sure that uh, kids are reading all summer long and doing experience at Summer Sky. And Ex Libris, which is the event we do here at the library, which is a, a beer and food tasting event that brings money into our annual fund as well. So uh, we had 525 people attend Ex Libris last year, and um, it's usually a very fun event in the fall. And then we also do something around Giving Tuesday. Last year we had a challenge grant from a donor of $10,000 from a donor named Jill Ball. And uh, we matched that with all the gifts on, on Giving Tuesday and all of that went towards the Penny Library. So by the end of the year, we kind of knew the Penny campaign was gonna be up and running again. So we, we started uh, making sure that we identified with that. And it's usually a really fun night at the Harmony Bar we do that. So, um, it's because we can bring together a group of donors like you who care really deeply about your libraries, about reading, about the community, that we can make all of these things happen. So um, it's really pretty remarkable. So these were our revenues in the last year. There is a mini, what we call the mini annual report over there that you can pick up and take with you. I think most of you should have gotten that by mail. We have a few full annual reports, which is online, which we have a few printed out copies as well. So I can just point to number four, which is our investment gain. So besides raising a lot of restricted money, it was a pretty remarkable year for our endowment fund. So that $868,000 is money that goes all back into our endowments. So it just increases our endowment fold um, for the long term to have such a good financial year for our endowments. Um, so I just want to say thank you uh, for being donors who care enough to come out to this event and uh, know that you are deeply appreciated. Um, our staff is here and, and they love working with you every year. Many of our board members are here and they're here because they volunteer their time because they love their library too. And so please ask us any questions. Um, I can take a few questions now, otherwise I will turn it over to a couple of the parts of the program. Um, and we'll continue on. Does anybody have any questions? I'm very happy to take a talk. Um, what is the relationship? I am new to this group in this area. The foundation and individual libraries have friends of the mm -hmm. library and have book sales and things like right. that. Well, the good thing is we always we all support the same goal, which is supporting our libraries. We do have nine friends groups in Madison, one for each library. <laughs> And they, some of them are independent nonprofits, have their 501c3s, and some of them don't. So a couple of them who don't, we're actually their fiscal sponsor. So their finances roll up into our finances, and we oversee their books as part of that process. But they have a different fundraising mechanism, which is membership, book sales, pie sales, things like that. They give all their money directly to the library. Um, but we kind of operate on some of the bigger cross-library functions um, but sometimes we support the same things too. You know, sometimes we both support the Meadow Ridge Kitchen or things like that. So we have the same goals, but kind of different mechanisms in terms of how we gather support. But if you are a neighborhood resident, I absolutely encourage you to be a member of your friends group. Um, they're volunteer-run organizations. They, they do really great things for their libraries. So I, I think they're all there to serve the same purpose. Any other questions? Well, again, thank you. I'm gonna invite Stu Levitan up to, to talk for a moment. So we mentioned the Silas Penny Legacy Society. And um, Stu and I were recently at a dinner together and he leaned over to me and said, you know, I just had this meeting and I wanted to tell you that I've decided to include you um, in my estate plan. And so I thought I would invite Stu up here to tell that story himself because it certainly gave me a smile um, and I was so pleased to hear it that I'm gonna let him tell you a little bit about that. If it gave you a smile, Jenny, you realize you don't get the money until I die. <laughs> but thank, thank you very much. I'm very happy to take just a few moments to talk about why I have joined the Silas Penny Society by including the Library Foundation in my will and to urge you all to do the same. It was Alfred Lord Tennyson who wrote, In the spring, a young man's fancy lightly turns the thoughts of love. Well, I'm here to tell you that in the metaphysical autumn, a middle-aged fancy, a middle-aged man's fancy turns to thoughts of the past. And as I leave middle age for senior citizen status, I know that in the winter, an old man's fancy turns to the future. 
or as the somewhat euphemistic phrase has it, estate planning. <laughs> and there's an anniversary coming up on Saturday that helps explain things. It was on June 23rd, 1965, that Madison dedicated its brand new $2.2 million Central Library to replace the old Madison Free Library, which was built in 1906 with funds from the Scottish industrialist Andrew Carnegie. About 175 people came out on a Wednesday evening for the affair and heard Mayor Otto Feske credit his predecessors, Mayor Ivan Nestigan and Henry Reynolds, for having done all the work for which he was happy to take the credit. And just as that Model T era library yielded to the Space Age Library, now we have this magnificent Internet Age Library literally built on the bones of that 1906 structure. And that's the thing about generations, that each one provides for the next. Sometimes it's an entire demographic cohort, the greatest generation left in America of peace and prosperity. Sometimes the generation is a political administration. Sometimes it's a family or an individual. But the instinct is always the same, to provide for those who come after us. Now, those of us who have been blessed with earthly success know that one thing above all is true. You can't take it with you. <laughs> sure, you can try to spend it all, but most people, I think, want to leave something for others to prove Mark Antony and William Shakespeare wrong, that the good is not interred with our bones, but it, not the evil, lives after us. That's why we plant trees we will never sit under. Now, the first people, the first people we seek to provide for, of course, are members of our family, primarily our children. And I know this very well because my father provided very well for me. And if you've ever walked past the staff room on the third floor or past the, you know, the digital scanners, you'll know just how well he provided for me. But I don't have the opportunity to provide for any children. So I have the ability, and not just the ability, the responsibility to help provide for my community. And among the first places I look to do that is the Madison Public Library Foundation. Why? Well, first of all, it's in my DNA. I come from a long line of rabbis and scholars and teachers and other people of the book. Next, there's a sense of personal gratitude. I've now written two books on the history of Madison and did all the foundational research at the Madison Public Library. Now, 15 years ago, that involved putting thousands of dimes into those bulky old <laughs> microfilm photocopiers. Uh, more recently, it involved making thousands of digital scans and downloading them on a thumb drive, uh, because technology has generations too, and I appreciate the new one. Uh, and finally, as an author, I have to admit, uh, my support for the library and the Wisconsin Book Festival has some self-interest in it. Not only do I need the library to be here for my next round of research, I need the book festival to be here so I can share the fruits of that research. <laughs> Such as on October 11th, when I'll be here to turn the money for Madison in the 60s. I mentioned earlier that this building was dedicated in this week in 1965. It was this week in 1966 that they finally tore down the stately old Carnegie Library on Carroll Street. And again, we turn to Tennyson. The old order changeth, yielding place to new. Generations. And just a few months after they tore down the original downtown library, the city opened a new library on the far east side in the C&P Shopping Center on Cottage Grove Road. They named it after a man who was a giant of the law both before and after. He was one of the most influential mayors of Madison of the 19th century. The man who got the council to create and fund the Madison Free Library in 1874. Of course, that was Silas Pinney. And each generation since has built on his legacy and left an even greater library for those to follow. I invite you. I welcome you. I urge you to join me in joining the Silas Finney Society so you too can be part of that unbroken chain of those helping to provide a great library system for generations and generations and generations to come. Thank you. So I am going to actually close our reception here. You are absolutely welcome to have a little more food and drink.
But in about 10 minutes, we wanna make sure you go take your reserved seat outside if you're gonna be staying for the author talk. Uh, Ijoma Olu is here, actually, for a meet and greet at the moment. And she will be signing books after the event. So you guys already have signed books. If you want them personalized, uh, you can do that after the author talk. But she'll be here for about the next 10 minutes for the meet and greet. And then we'll make sure you all get a seat. So thank you for coming tonight. Thank you for being supporters of the library. And I hope to see you this time next year.